Hello everyone and welcome to another video. New year, new studio, and of course, new information to share with you, my friends. Today we're gonna to be talking about a very important topic that has been requested on the live streams, which is baking. How do we get all of the mesh maps that we need so that we can utilize all of the tools that we have for texturing inside of our texturing software. So let's go. We're going to start here with this mask. This is from a personal project I did last year. I don't think I've shared it yet. And this one right here has a bunch of different pieces. And this is the most important thing that I want you to share. If there's something that you're going to be taking away from this video and you're going to be skipping in the next five minutes or whatever, I want you to remember this. It's very important to have clean UVs clean topology, of course, or a clean low poly, and clean organization of your names to get the best bakes possible, okay? So this is the low poly of our element. And our low poly, every single element in our scene is named with the name that it represents, mask high, mask low, ear left, ear right, tooth right, tooth left, all of them. And they all have this underscore low and underscore high prefix. That's one of the important things that we need to remember because we're gonna be using this suffixes, sorry, suffixes to tell substance to find the important information that we're looking for, okay? So this is very, very important. We want all of this information to be here on our names, we want clean UVs and clean topology. Now, for the high poly, we actually want a specific kind of preparation as well. And this is mainly if you're trying to find ways to quickly mask out areas inside of your object. You can see, for instance, here that the mask low that we have right here, like, overrides or overlaps quite heavily with this like symbol that we have here on the front. And if we try to paint this instead of substance, it's very easy to paint on both sub like surfaces. So it's very important to separate them. And one way to do that is by using an ID mask. Now, in order to do this, I'm using the material approach, not the vertex color. I've talked about the vertex color before. That's another method, very similar, but right now I'm using the material approach. So to all of the parts that I want to be a specific ID mask, I'm adding this material. As you can see, it's just MJ. It's just a basic Lambert material with a green color. And for all of the gold areas, I'm adding this one right here, which is the gold or yellow color. Now that I have this, I'm going to grab the group of the high mask and grab all of the elements within it, making sure that we have one element for each of the other ones on the other side. And I'm going to export this selection. I'm going to go here, desktop mask bakes open there, and this is going to be called mask, mask underscore high, there we go. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing with the other ones. You can press G to repeat the last action. And this one, I'm just going to call it mask underscore low. So we're going to have an FPX that contains all of the information from the high poly and then an FPX that contains all of the information from the low poly. This is all you need to get out of your software. It could be Maya, Blender, Cinema 4D, whatever you want, ZBrush even. And this is what we're going to be bringing into Substance Painter. Let's go to Substance now. Now that we're here inside of Substance, I'm going to go File, New, and we're going to create a new file, right, Desktop. We got the mask bakes here, and we're going to select the low poly, of course, not the high poly, the low poly. I'm going to do 2K and OpenGL. This is usually what I work with, unless I'm doing like something very, very big. But in this case, this is a relatively small mask. So as you can see, this is what we get. Not bad. It's not looking great, of course. There's a lot of like weird normals looking around. But this is relatively common when you're dealing with very, very low poly assets or elements like this one. I'm going to press uh, F3 here, or sorry, F2, so that we're in the 3D view only. And we can now jump onto the actual bakes right here. So I'm going to go to the bakes and we're going to set this to the same size as our document, 2K in this case, and we're going to load in our high poly. And this is where the issues start. This is where a lot of people start sort of like freaking out. So when we load this in, the first thing that we're going to see is this, which is called the cage. The cage is the actual mesh that's going to be projecting or is going to be trying to receive all of the information from the high poly. Now, Substance is very kind and it's actually telling us, hey, if you bake this right now, you're going to have some issues because there's a couple of elements here that are like above or beyond the surfaces of the current cage. So here, what you need to do is you need to play a little bit with max frontal distance to push the cage further out so that we can properly capture all of those elements. There is a problem with doing this. It's not going to happen with this particular asset, but especially with assets that have things that are very close together, for instance, fingers. If the cage starts hitting other parts of another finger, you will get sort of like contamination from one thing to another. So there's different methods or ways to avoid this. Some people will do multiple bakes and then they'll use a software like Photoshop to mix parts of one bake and parts of the other by using different distances for the cages. In Marmoset, for instance, we can actually control the distance of the cage per object. So if your hands and your head are separate, you can change how much you want to increase or decrease the cage. So again, there's tools. But for this particular one and for, I would say, 90% of the asset, you're not going to have to do it. As long as you have a clean retopology, you should be getting a nice result. Can you see now why retopology is so important? 
I always tell you guys, I get criticized on, on Instagram quite a bit about my my freaking, like, uh, uh, what's the word, like, uh, obsessiveness about uh, retopology, but it's really important. So once we have this, we're going to add a couple more things. First, anti-aliasing. I usually like to go with 16x. Uh, for those of you that don't know what anti-aliasing is, which if you're studying 3D and you don't know what, what anti-aliasing is, it's a little bit concerning, but... Everyone can learn something new every day. So anti-aliasing is this very simple thing. When we're, we're dealing with monitors or screens that are pixel-based, then whenever you have a line that's going in a different direction than the orientation of the pixels, you're going to get this sort of like stair-step effect, right? And this happens the same thing when we bake textures into our UV maps because UV maps are pixel-based, right? So they're like a, like a square grid. And if you have lines or elements that are going in different directions, you will get a little bit of this. So by adding a little bit of anti-aliasing, we sort of like soften up those edges and we get a nicer result. Can you do 64x yeah that's fine it's gonna look a little bit nicer a little bit cleaner but it's also gonna take longer and right now i don't want this to be super super long now this is the first part where we're gonna be using the suffix thing that we talked about and this is the match option okay so if i just bake the textures right now what's gonna happen is all of the elements are gonna project the effects or the the bakes right they're gonna bake into each other element but they will contaminate the scene a little bit what do I mean by this well you can see for instance here on the actual mask this crown thingy this yellow thing that we have as an extra element it's actually projecting the exact same detail onto the mask sometimes it's not gonna be noticeable if you are a little bit more careful about your overlaps it shouldn't be that much uh, visible but it's it's not looking nice right it's not looking great and in in order for us to change that a little bit, what we can do is say, hey, change the match option to by mesh name. And if I do this and I go to this matching by name, you're going to see that substance. Oh, let me turn off my camera for just a second. You're going to see the substance finds that there's one object name underscore low and one object name underscore high for each of the different elements that we have in our scene. If we do that and we bake the selected textures now, what's going to happen is we're going to avoid baking the normal information, only the normal information, into the objects, okay? So now you can see the mask face right there is a lot cleaner. We still bake down the ambient occlusion information, so we get that nice little shadow there where both objects are sort of like overlapping each other. We even get a little bit of shadow here where this little detail is overlapping with the element. So that's nice. We can control whether we want the ambient occlusion to be baked down or not. Where do we control this? Well, of course, down here on the ambient occlusion tab. So on the ambient occlusion tab, you can change this same self occlusion to only same mesh name as well. And if you do that, then the occlusion won't affect other parts of the element. So the little crown right here won't affect the mask. I don't want that for this particular asset because I only I only change this if the assets that I'm doing are things that are going to be moving around or being separated from the character or there's going to be like an exploded view or something like this. As long as the object is going to remain like sort of solid like this one right here, you really don't need to add this information, okay? So yeah, that's it. Now there's one more that we can change and that's the thickness. You can also use self-occlusion for the thickness. This, again, if you're doing skin and you want to like take some things out or in into the consideration of the thickness, you can do that as well. But that's pretty much it. By doing this, we've successfully baked down the six, seven maps that are the most important maps that we have here inside of Substance. Normal map, world space normal map, ID map, ambient occlusion map, curvature map, position map, and thickness map. And I'm going to show you now how and why all of these maps are so important. The first thing that we need to understand is that for us to see the details of the high poly in this low poly, we need the normal map. That's, I would say, like the most important map that you're going to be baking out and what we normally know by uh, the baking process, right? We transfer the high poly details into the low poly thanks to the normal map. And that's the one that we're seeing right here. A lot of the other uh, like uh, maps that we get are also extracted from this normal map. That's why it's so important. But again, it's not the only important one. If we go here to texture set settings, you're going to see that all of the mesh maps are included here on the side. Normal, world space, ID, ambient occlusion, curvature, position, thickness. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. On the ID map, you can see that by default it's set to material color. That's why it works. And that's why we have the division between green and yellow. If you are using vertex color, you want to change this to vertex color right there. So there's multiple ways to get this ID map. Okay. So how do this work? Well, let's say we want to talk about the world space normal map. What does that do? Let me show you the map first. I'm going to use a field layer here. And on the color, I'm literally going to look for the world space normal map. There we go. And just fill the color with this one. So this is, I present to you, the world space normal map. And the world space normal map is a very cool map that tells us where each face from the high poly is facing in 
relationship with the world. So all of the faces that are facing up will be green. All of the faces that are facing forward will be blue. And all of the faces that are facing red will be, or sorry, right, will be red, okay? From right to left. Of course, you're gonna get different gradients on the different elements, but that's usually how it works. And as you can see, we get this very, very nice gradient. Now, why is this important? Why do we need this mask? Well, let me give you a quick example. Let's say, so let's say we're using this like a rock color and I'm gonna make it a little bit darker so that we can see what I'm about to show you. Oh my God, it's like multiple colors. So imagine this is like a, like, a, like a stone mask or whatever, and this has been out in the wild for a long time, right? So what I can do is I can add, for instance, a rust layer on the top and say, hey, I want this rust layer to be like dust, not rust. So I'm gonna make this more of a, of a light beige color. And of course, I don't want it to be everywhere. I just want it to be on the faces that are facing up, right? So right click, add a black mask, right click, add a generator, and we can add, for instance, a light generator. And by doing this, I can point the light so it's only hitting, let's increase the, the highlight level or rather, there we go, the glossiness. There we go. So now only the faces that are facing towards the top are getting this particular mask. Why? Because this generator in particular, as you can see, is using two maps, the world space normal and the position map. Thanks to these two mesh maps that we baked down, we can use this generator. If we don't have these elements, nothing works. The generator is not going to work. That's why, a very common mistake, if you're trying to texture something and you forgot to do your, do your bakes, all of the generators, the metal edgeware, the dirt, all of these things, they will not work because you're not using the maps that we need. So, again, let's do the fill layer right there. Uh, there we go. The world space normal. This is the map that we have right here. Very, very important map to be able to know where faces are pointing. The next map is, of course, a favorite of a lot of people, and that's, of course, the ambient occlusion map. Let me add just like a, a little bit of a darker, something like that. Actually, let's do, it's going to be like a green color. I'm just going to make it very rough so that we can see more of a flat effect. There we go. So if I add another field layer, for instance, and let's say this is going to be a black layer, what I can do here is I can, actually, this is going to, yeah, black layer is fine. I'm going to add a black mask, or rather, just on the field layer, on the color here, I'm just going to add the ambient occlusion right? So the ambient occlusion, we should, again, most of us know what this is. The ambient occlusion is a black and white map that tells us where there's more occlusion between the objects. So where light is having a little bit more of a hard time getting into the object. In this case, if I were to set this to multiply, for instance, we get rid of the white color and we only keep this sort of like a black color that we have right here. There we go. So you can see the difference between no ambient occlusion and ambient occlusion right there. And if I go back to normal, this is what we get. Now, a cool thing about the normal map is that you can actually use a levels, for instance, to adjust it and you can push and get more shadow out of it. You can push the whites to be less intense and more into this sort of like gray tone. You can even push the blacks to not be as intense and make them a little bit more of a darker gray. So there's a lot of control that you can have on your ambient occlusion like pass because this map is super, super, super useful. Now, as you can see right here, this map right here, it's only a black and white mask, and right now we're using it on the fill layer, but you can use this within a layer stack in your mask to drive where you want certain detail to be or where do you want to hide certain details. So you can use the ambient occlusion both as a positive mask or as a negative mask. Remember that if you want to invert the ambient occlusion, you need to use a levels and just invert this. And now all of the things that were cavity, right, like the things that are occluded are now white, so they're going to be seen, they're going to be visible in your mask, and all of the things that are dark are not going to be seen are not going to be seen as much. So another very, very important map, the ambient occlusion. The next one is one of my favorites. Again, if we go here, it's going to be the ID mask. And the ID mask is, again, something that we can use to quickly mask certain elements. Let's say I add a rust layer here and I want to paint out, right, with a black mask, this part right here. Of course, I can go here and try to paint it one by one. And it's going to take me a little bit. As you can see, I'm going to, like, touch other parts of the object and then I'm going to press X to try to delete them. It's a little bit, like, complicated, right? It's, it's very tedious to do this. I can, of course, go to number four, which is my polygon fill tool, and fill the objects. And as long as they're separate objects, it's going to be an easy way to fill them up. But ID mask, especially with very complex objects, and I showed this last year with the Blake Doctor's mask and the stitches, one thing that you can do is add a black mask right here, right-click on the mask, and then add a color selection node. And as you can see, the color selection, what mesh mask or map is it using? The ID mask. Can you now see how all of the things within Substance need these maps to, to properly work? This is why bakes are so important. 
So I just pick color, pick the yellow, and that's it. And the cool thing is you can pick multiple colors. So if you have, like, let's say, a yellow and a green or a yellow and a blue, and you want multiple things to share the same material, you can use this with multiple colors. So very, very handy map as well to, to do this. The next map that we need to talk about is one that's a favorite of a lot of you, but you don't remember it or you don't think about it too much, which is, of course, the Metal Edgeware. So this one, the Metal Edgeware and the Dirt Layers, they usually work with this map, which is mesh map that's called the Curvature Map. Okay, so the curvature map, as you can see right here, it's a black and white map. No, there we go. It's a black and white map that tells substance where the peaks and the valleys are in your object. Peaks, the convex areas, are going to be white, and valleys, the convex areas, the, the depths or the deep areas, are going to be dark. This is not an ambient occlusion map. If I go just to the color, you can see that there's no ambient occlusion between the pieces. It's just what parts are like a hard surfacey edge and what parts are going in, right? Like these deep edges. And this mask, again, this curvature mask, is one of the things that we use for the metal edgeware. Again, if I were to go, uh, let's say, let me go to material and let's say I'm going to use like a lighter green color here for like a metal edgeware, add a black mask, we add a generator and we use the metal edgeware generator and boom, all of the edges get highlighted, right? This is because again, this generator is using three things or actually four things, world space normal, position, curvature and ambient occlusion. So curvature is the important one that we are trying to use in this particular situation. We're using this to highlight where the high points of the element are and where the low points of the element are as well. Now, the next map is something that we are not really going to be using on this particular one as much. Well, and this one is the thickness map, okay? So the thickness map is something that we use a little bit more in things like skin. So let's say this is like a skin mask. It's going to be very weird, but imagine this is like a Oh, something like this right here. And we want to add like a surface pass to the whole thing. What I can do here is I can use a very bright red color as a black mask. And in the fill layers, I can use not the curvature, not the ambient occlusion, but the thickness map. And as you can see, the parts, let's go to C here, the parts that are the thicker are going to be the redder, and the parts that are not as thick or are thinner, right, they're not going to be as red. In this case, we want to flip that. So I'm just going to use a levels here to invert this, and this looks a little bit more to what you would expect from, like, a, again, like a sur surfacey effect, right? Thinner areas look a little bit redder, and then thicker areas are not going to look as red. Again, I normally use this technique, for instance, on the substance course, where we are painting, like, a more realistic type of skin. You can then use this as a mask to mask out the actual sur surface effect in your engine. But, um, yeah, this is not something that you're going to use all the time, but it's good to have, especially for this sort of, like, translucency or translucency objects that you have on your scene. And last but not least, this is another one of my favorite ones, is the position mask, okay? So the position mask is a mask that has to do with the, um, let's say, the relationship of your object to the world itself. So if I go again here to the base color and I look not for thickness, but for position, there we go. You're going to see that we, again, get a gradient, similar to the world space normal map, but not exactly the same. Remember, the world space normal will tell us where each of the faces is like pointing towards. And this one in particular is doing something different, which is telling us where it is in relationship with the world. So the higher the faces are in the world, the greener they're going to go. The more to the right or to the left they are, the redder they're going to go. And more to the, the front or to the back, the more blue they're going to be, right? So it's, again, a gradient. And where is this important? Well, imagine we're using... Let me use another metal edgeware right here. And I want to add a black mask. And I'm going to add another generator. And we're using, let's say, the posi position generator, right? Let's uh, flip it so that we can see it. This one, this global balance that tells us, hey, this is closer to the ground floor or farther away from the ground floor, is thanks to the position gradient that we have right here that's being like inherited from this world position map that we have. Okay? So that's it, guys. That is it. Let me show you one final thing right here. There we go. So pretty much like getting all the infinity stones, we got all of the bakes right here. Normal map, world space normal, world position, curvature map, ambient occlusion, thickness, and ID map. These seven maps are the essential maps that you should get whenever you're texturing things inside of Substance Painter, inside of Marmoset, inside of pretty much any texturing software, because they will give you a lot of information to use generators, procedural effects, textures, 
and different types of masking in order to get the effects that you're looking for. So yeah, this is it, guys. If you like this uh, more of a little bit of a technical video, well, let me know here in the comments. Of course, your comments, your likes, your subscriptions are always appreciated. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Substance Painter and the texturing process, make sure to check our courses down here on the description. That's it, my friends. Don't forget, always learning, always improving, and I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye.